remember seeing anything about Converge inside the Illinois mobile app, but we provided event um, matching recommendations essentially on the events that showed up there. Um, so after working with JP for many months um, in around March of 2020, uh, he decided he wanted to hire us for the company he was starting, Rock Metro, to basically take the Illinois app to other universities. Um, and that was all based on our experience working as a team with his team at Rockwire. So that is how our company got started. And we'll hand it back to Stephen to talk a little bit more about what we do. Right. Yeah, so um, as Brian mentioned, uh, so we started up Rock Metro. Uh, JP hired our whole team out of out of school and uh, you know, we got to got to working on. Uh, essentially, this this company was founded uh, again. Rockwire is an open source platform that was started here on campus. Rock Metro was founded to help promote that open source project outside of the University of Illinois for other universities organizations that are interested in doing similar things. Because the success of an open source platform is really dependent on its reach, right, and getting more more organizations involved. So uh, that's what we do here at Rock Metro. Uh, for the past couple of years, uh, we've been working with other universities to help manage COVID on campuses using the technology that was developed in the Safer Illinois app, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Uh, so we essentially uh, productized that um, and delivered an ecosystem to other campuses to help facilitate testing and uh, test results and you know, you know, guidelines, all of that, right, uh, to help keep uh, students and faculty and staff healthy and safe on campus during COVID. Um, so now at this point, what we're doing is transitioning away from the COVID solution back to the original university platform, and we're looking for people to help us do that. So. Um, yeah, if any of you are interested in learning more about Rockwire and participating on campus, if any of you are interested in talking about Rock Metro and potentially joining our team, uh, definitely feel free to let me know. We're gonna hang out here after class and uh, take any questions or anything like that. We also have time for a few questions right now if anyone has any. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So Safer Illinois was the yeah. So that's that's been our primary product. Is is we have something called Safer Community that we took to other schools, right? So yeah, we've been involved in the platform development from the very beginning. There, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I know LP currently has um, focus on like, deep learning and AI. Mm -hmm. um, when you guys participated in Alchemy, did you also operate with developing technologies related to it? Yeah, yeah. So there is a focus on that. Um, we, you know, our, our team, I think every team has their own approach, right? Our team was more of a, a product approach, more of a, a you know, um, we wanted to build something tangible. We wanted to build an app. We were less interested in doing research or anything like that, but some teams were very dedicated on the research, right? So that's a great question. Um, for us, we did do uh, some application of, of uh, AI machine learning type stuff, right, in order to facilitate our recommendations, but the, the emphasis was really on building a product that someone could use, right? Yeah, good question. I still have the Converge app installed on my yeah. phone. I don't know if it still works anymore, to be honest. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I wish it would. I mean, I have so many times I want to use it. Yeah, I don't know that we mentioned what it actually does, but essentially what we were doing is trying to find, help people find places to meet up. So, like, um, specifically we were kind of focused on restaurants at first, like helping people find restaurants that matched everyone's preferences, whether it's location. We used Yelp to, as our data source, so we pulled in a bunch of stuff from Yelp um, and then matched it up based off of... Uh, Distance, uh, pricing, cuisine, all this stuff, and then we, you know, built an algorithm to essentially help find the best option, and then uh, give people the UI to be able to select one and, and go meet there. So, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So we do have uh, uh, additional uh, work that we're doing with, you know, healthcare based off of the work that we did for COVID. Um, so we're expanding in that direction. We also, uh, you know, the, the Rockwire initiative was originally kind of conceived as a big picture sort of smart city initiative, right? So essentially integrating all these systems around campuses. Uh, campuses are a great example, right? Because it's a small sort of test bed and smaller version of a bigger city, right? Um, so that's the starting point, but uh, there's lots of uh, thoughts on where we could head from there into all these different areas. So yeah, great question. All right, great. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think we want to save a little bit of time for a tiled convolution. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's we'll, good. we'll turn this back over to Sanjay and let him uh, tell you more about uh, the course contents, which is what you're here for. So Stephen and Ryan, uh, you're, you're hanging out, but well, you'll be available afterwards, yep, right? Yeah, okay. we'll be here. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to talk, we'll be uh, right outside. Or we'll stay right up here. We'll come, come meet us right up here, and we'll, we'll talk. Great. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot, guys.
You know, you know I'll, I'm going to just say one more thing about this. Um, what's exciting for me personally is exactly what they said, what they alluded to, which is you're here. Uh, you're at a point in your lives where you have a lot of energy and you don't know what can't be done. I don't want to use the word naive because that's the wrong word. Really, it's the wrong word. But you don't know what can't be done, so you do it, and you succeed. And something great happens as a result of that. If you work with people like, if I work with people my age, we know all the things that can't be done, and we don't do them. So I like working with people like you. And I see it over and over and over again. So that's what gets me excited. It also gets me excited to give you an opportunity to do that thing that can't be done. Meaning, we just headstrong go through it, and all of a sudden, at the end of the day, we create something uh, or create an opportunity for you. And for me, that's really meaningful. So I'm hoping that by the end of the semester, I've convinced a few of you to join me on whatever is going to be here and what's going to be here and what's going to be here. I don't know what those are yet. but. I'm looking, maybe with you. Okay, that said, let's switch gears. Um, again, just to put us into context, uh, we talked about matrix multiply last week, and I insisted that's an important computational kernel, and indeed it is. I kind of went through the story of, yeah, I learned matrix multiply when I was younger and never fully realized how important it would be for my career later in life. And it's certainly been the case. So it's important, and I think it will be important throughout your careers as a base computational element. Same thing with convolution. I learned it in my systems class, signals and systems class, where I fell asleep almost every lecture because I just didn't understand the importance or the application of that. But it's here, it's like part of my life. And if you do any work with computer vision or deep learning involving computer vision, you can't escape the convolution. It's that important. So let's spend a little bit more time on convolution. And in particular today, we're going to try to address this looming issue of memory bandwidth. Okay. Now, we tried to deal with it last time by using the constant memory, taking the mask and putting it into constant memory. But it turns out it doesn't solve the problem. And let's just do a, a very quick back-of-the-envelope assessment here. Okay. So for every output, let's talk about the 1D case, right? So I've got a one-dimensional signal, and I'm taking this mask, and I'm sliding it across this one-dimensional signal to compute a bunch of output elements that are also a one-dimensional signal convolved with the mask. Okay, so for each output element, what I'm doing is... I'm using two times mask width loads, right? Because I have to load the original elements of M, I'm sorry, N, which is the input, the input signal, along with the mask. And what we said is, yeah, the mask we're going to put into constant cache, so I don't really have to load it from global memory. It gets cached. But I'm still loading a floating point value for every input element. Right, so I've got one load of n for every two floating point operations that I'm going to perform. Right, I load, I do a multiply, and I do an add. Now for the 2D case, it gets even worse because for the 2D case, I've got this patch, square patch. We're going to use a square mask that I'm going to overlay on my 2D input. So 
Yes, I've got to load the mask for each output element. Fine, that's in the cache. So I've gotten, I've taken care of that. But I've got to now load mask with squared input elements from n in order to accomplish the calculation of each output. So I've got a lot of floating point I need to do, Flo uh, loads I need to do um, for the floating point operations, right? So it's basically one floating point operation, I'm sorry, one floating point load for every two floating point operations. And that's not a good ratio. That ratio needs to really be a tenth of a load for every floating point operation to match the bandwidth that we expect to see on these devices. Okay, a little bit of a hand-waving arithmetic there, but hopefully it makes sense to you. We still have too much, we, we don't have enough uh, arithmetic intensity in the way we have structured this. That's basically what I'm saying. Now it turns out we can do something about it. Okay, but before we do something about it, what we need to do is kind of map this into the CUDA domain, first of all. Okay, and what we're gonna say is, okay, we've got this long set of output elements. That's P, that's what we're calculating. One thread, one output. So we're going to have a thread calculate P0, thread calculate P1. And because of the way we structure these uh, threads, what we're first going to do is introduce the idea of tiling. Okay, so let's say we've got a tile of threads. So four threads in the tile. To make things easy, let's just say thread, the tile and block are the same thing. So I've got a bunch of threads, I put them into a block, four threads in a block. So I've got thread zero, one, two, three, three, calculating P0, P1, P2, and P3. And so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, now if I take a look at P0, P1, P2, and P3, uh, and I try to understand what input elements of N that first tile requires, I have it right here, right? So if I'm trying to calculate P0, I need some elements that are off the edge. We call those the ghost elements, they're not real elements. And then I need, I need N0, N1, N2, N3, no, N, N2, right? Just in order to calculate P0. P1 needs this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one, and so on and so forth. And what I determine is, okay, for tile zero, I need all of these elements in order to calculate the output associated with that tile. Likewise, tile one needs two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on and so forth, right? These are the input elements of N required by each of these tiles. So in this case, the mask width is five, the tile size is four. And just to introduce yet another piece of terminology, Let's take a look at tile two, okay? For tile two, what we have is, we've got this set of elements right here that we're calculating for. For example, tile two is calculating uh, element eight, nine, 10, and 11. Well, we need eight, nine, 10, and 11, but we also need this six and seven, and 12 and 13, which we call the halo elements. We call them halo elements, it's gonna be quite clear when we talk about the 2D case, because it's kind of the boundary of all that input. Okay, if we've got 
a 2D case, that thing looks like a, 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 you know, a, a ring around the data. You'll see that in a moment. And if we're talking about the 3D case, it's like a little shell around the, the tile, which is the, uh, the data that comes from adjacent tiles, we can consider it. Okay, makes sense? Now, here's the trick. If you look at this, what you'll notice is there's a lot of overlap in terms of the data items that we are we are using here. You could think about it this way. Let's think about it just from the tiles perspective. Okay, so if I've got tile four, five, six, seven, that's one block of threads, let's say. We use element two once, right? We're using element two in order to calculate output four. Element three is used to cal calculate output four and five and, and so on and so forth, right? So if I've got a, a tile of size four and a mask of size five, you can see that certain elements are used, the middle elements in particular, are used multiple times. And it's only the trailing and leading edge that are used less frequently. So if I've got a long signal with a big tile, let's say the tile is you know, 256 threads, then I've got a lot of reuse happening in the middle section. In fact, what is this reuse, this nice, heavy reuse, what's, what's it based on? Why is this four? What drives that four? Yep. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, this is related to the mask width, right? Because as I slide that mask over, all those elements, whenever they fall in the mask, will be reused by some element of the output. So I'm getting something related to the mask width in this 1D case in terms of the reuse factor. That's great. I want to certainly do that. What do you think it's going to be? Let's just take one quick step ahead. What do you think it's going to be for the 2D case? It's, this is somehow linearly related to mask width. What do you think it'll be for the 2D case? We'll get there if you don't see it yet, but go ahead. Something related to mask width squared. Right, again, same idea. I'm taking the mask and I'm just shifting it over all elements. Right, so we're going to get something, the, 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 I mean, anytime we square a number, that's always great. We like those kinds of uh, relationships, at least in terms of reuse. Okay, so clearly what we want to do is we want to take all the elements that that particular tile needs, four, five, six, seven, obviously a very small tile, of four threads, we would never really do that in practice. But for a PowerPoint slide, it works. So four threads, those four threads need some input data. We want to take that input data from N and put it in shared memory. Right, so what in specific do we want in shared memory? We one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That is the input tile of data that the output tile needs to calculate. Now, the, the, the thing about convolution that makes this a little more challenging is the shape of that input, or the size of that input in the 1D case. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't match. So we've got to deal with the mismatch, 
Right? Why doesn't it match? Well, because of the halos. Right? So what do I mean by that? So if the blue area is the output, those are the output elements of P that I'm generating. So one thread, one output element. And what I need in terms of calculating that output is certainly the corresponding input of N. But then I also need the left, let's call it the left halo. And then I also need the right halo. So I need to load all that stuff in. And it turns out that there's a number of different ways I can do this. And uh, we're going to talk about three different ways here today. Strategy one, strategy two, and strategy three. And these are like the most straightforward ways you could think of if you just sat down and tried to write them down. Okay, so for example, what we could do is we could say, okay, I've got a block size of n threads. And those n threads cover the output, meaning one thread, one output. And then what we'll do is we'll use some threads to load the left halo. And then some threads, or all the threads, to load the middle section. And then some threads to load the right halo, or something like that, okay? Where some of the threads participate in loading the halos, and all of the threads participate in loading the middle section. That's one strategy. Uh, let me talk about strategy three because it's also quite simple. Okay, well, this is kind of like the easy way out. If it's left or right halo, I just get it from global memory. But if it's in the middle, have each thread load its corresponding input element and put it into shared memory. Right, that's, in fact, the code for that, which I'll show you, very, very simple. Um, and that, in some cases, may be the best way to do it. Strategy two is a little more involved. But I like to cover it because I think it shows us the complexity of dealing with situations like this in CUDA. So in strategy two, what we're going to say is, okay, the, the size of my block, meaning the number of threads, is this. So if my input is size n, well, let me not use n, let's say size x, then I'm going to have something smaller in terms of number of threads generate the output. So not every thread will generate output, but every thread will load from global memory into shared memory. Okay, those are kind of three ways. And again, which one is the best depends. You'll find out for lab three. Um, but the point here is just to illustrate the different options to you. Okay, any questions about at a high level, what these concepts, the, the, the strategies are. Question. It can be two steps, yeah. yeah the, the, in fact, what I would like to say is some number of threads participate in loading the halos, but all the threads participate in loading the middle section, yes. For strategy two? No, for all of the strategies, we want the input to end up in shared memory. Okay, at least the middle section of the input in shared memory. That's why we're doing this. If we don't put it in shared memory, we don't get the benefit of reuse. Right, if we didn't care about shared memory, then the code I gave you last time is enough. Okay, any, yeah, question? Uh, 
so, okay, I think what you're asking is, is, is it better to do strategy three or one of strategy two or one of the other strategies, right? I think that's what you're asking. Again, I don't know. It depends on the context, right? It depends on the types of convolutions you're doing, whether they're 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D, et cetera. The size, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So if, for example, you were doing this because you were going to build a library that was going to be used at your company, you might even special case it so that, okay, here's a type of kernel that people will do, and I'm going to use strategy one because it's the best performing strategy as I've measured it for, the, for that type of convolution. Make sense? Yep. Ideally, like, you know, in fact, I think somebody in this class asked at the beginning of the, the, the semester, why are we doing any of this? Why do we bother with any of this? Uh, shouldn't the compiler automatically do the right thing? And why, as a human, do we need to do any of this? And that's a really good insight. Right? Here, this is code optimization, really. Um, there's nothing fundamentally algorithmic about it. And somehow the system should just give me the best version. The problem is we don't have that yet. That technology hasn't been built yet. That compiler technology, that optimization technology. But maybe one of you will build it or participate in building it. It's a need. And until we have that, we as coders, developers, have to do it ourselves. Okay. Okay, so let's go into some details. So what we're going to do is just in detail look at strategy one to start with. Okay. Um, and we'll look at the other strategies as well. But we're going to start with a one-dimensional strategy one example. And I'm not going to use your variation okay, to start with. I like your variation. I'll show you the code for it. But what I'm going to do is in three steps. Load the right halo, load the middle section, load the left halo. And I'm going to do that just to show you what that might look like. So what I'm going to calculate, or what I'm going to set up first, is the shared memory itself. Right? I need the shared memory tile. I'll call it n underscore ds, where it is the size of the tile. Right? That's the entire size of the tile, plus mask minus 1. Right? Plus mask minus one is to accommodate for the left in the right halo. Very simple. I'm going to create this variable radius, local variable, thread private, called the radius mask over two. Integer division, so I'm truncating. So if it's a mask of five, radius is two. And then what I want to be able to calculate is the starting position of that left halo that I'm going to call the left or halo index left. Okay. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm just taking the block that I'm, that, that's my block index, subtracting one from it and shifting it over. Really? So if this is my block, halo index left is essentially the index of the previous block. So if my index is 4, this one is going to be 0. Halo index left will be 0. So I've got kind of, this, I'm not really pointing at 2 with index, halo index left. I'm pointing at 0 because it's a tile width of tiles over. And then what I'll do is each thread will go through this logic. If the thread index 
is large enough. And we are within bounds. Either don't do anything. Oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, so some threads will load and some threads will not load, right? So there is no else to this if. So based on the thread index, either we'll load some elements or we won't load some elements, right? So in this particular case, we have thread zero, thread one, thread two, thread three. Given this logic, which threads end up loading elements two and three? So that's a question for you. So given this logic, I've got four threads, thread zero to thread three. We're trying to load the left halo. There's only two elements. I don't need all four threads loading stuff. Given this logic, which are the two threads that load stuff? Remember, the only threads I have are threads 0, 1, 2, and 3, right? So those are my thread indices. So I, th I don't know that you really meant 6 and 7. I think you meant something else. But what did you mean? Someone else? Yeah. Two and three. Threads 2 and 3. OK, so I've got four threads. Those four threads are dealing with, let me, let me write this down on the slide. So, so I have in this case thread 0, thread 1, thread 2, thread 3, right? They are going to be working on um, those elements of the output. But we need to also end up loading the left and the right. So... I've got four threads, only two of them need to do something on the left, and only two of them need to do something on the right. Okay, so I don't need to load N0, I don't need to load N1, I do need to load three, I'm sorry, N2 and N3. Likewise on the right, I do need to load this, I do need to load that, I do not need that, and I do not need that. So the question is, with this logic, which of the four threads are actually loading stuff? And it turns out that thread two, thread three will load element two and element three here. Okay. Um, that's what this if statement does. Why do I have this if statement here? What does that accomplish? Yep. Exactly. And this has to deal with halo elements that are on the ghost, or that are ghost elements, meaning they're off the end of the array. Okay. So um, if you're feeling confused with this, don't worry about it. Code is here, you can come back to it. Conceptually, you need to understand what we're doing. Conceptually, what we're trying to do is load the left halo and we accomplish it with this code. Okay. Now, loading the internal elements, meaning loading four, five, and four, five, six, and seven, is super easy because each thread participates. Thread zero, one, two, three, 
all participate in doing the load. But we have to have this check here. Question. We won't, ha we won't have halo threads, right? Because each thread calculates one element of the output with strategy one. Okay, so each thread calculates one value of P by definition. Um, so this is just checking to see if we're actually, this is a valid output element. It's a valid output element, go and grab the corresponding element of n, the internal. And then now we have to do the same thing on the right, meaning thread 0, 1, 2, and 3. will be mapped over here. And again, we don't want this or that element. We just want the 8 and the 9. So again, we're going to just check to see that the thread index is smaller than the radius, so that it actually will either be thread 0, thread 1, and then we do the load. Okay. So again, let's not get too hung up on the code. Let's make sure that we conceptually understand what we're trying to do. We've got four threads. We deal with the left halo, we deal with the middle section, and we deal with the right halo. And if I put all that code together, it's right here. Strategy one, one-dimensional. Uh, looks kind of ugly, and indeed it is. There's a better way to do this, but I wanted to conceptually throw this out there. I deal with the left, I deal with the middle, I deal with the right. Why do I have a sync threads there? Well, before we talk about that, here's the actual work, which is to do the convolution itself right down here. Right? In this case, all of my inputs are coming from shared memory multiplied by the mask. Right, that's the, uh, where the real work happens. But why the sync threads? Yep. So conceptually, yes, but you're using words that are not quite right. I want, to, I want to make sure we're very precise here. Yes? Uh, do you have to wait until all the data has been loaded into the shared memory before you start accessing it? Thank you. I think that's what you meant, but I wanted to hear data into shared memory before you access. So we're putting a bunch of stuff in shared memory here, in parallel, using a bunch of threads. Those threads are operating asynchronously. They're operating at different times, different speeds, potentially. Some threads finish quickly, some threads don't. I found this on the web. Oh, boy. <laughs> so we've got to wait. Right, we've got to synchronize everybody before anybody uses that data. Okay. Any questions on this? Yeah. So I, um, sorry, can you repeat? Oh, so are you, are you saying, do I need a sync threads down here? Well, do I? She's saying no, why not? Yeah, exactly. This is all happening in parallel. Once you finish your output element, you're done. The thread goes to wherever threads that are done go. Right? There's nothing else to do. There's no loop around this, right? So no, no one is depending on that except for whatever happens at the end of the kernel. All right. 
if we don't complete the load before we start the computation. So here's the, com here's the load. I think you meant store. Yeah? So here's the load, right? I need to finish this stores. These stores have to finish before I do this load. That's why the sync threads is there. Any other questions? Good, let's move on. Um, here's the two-step version. It's there in the notes if you wanna look at it, it's much simpler. I, I like this version. Um, but I do wanna put up strategy three because this is the one that I said was very straightforward. Okay, uh, so what we're doing here is every thread loads its corresponding element of shared memory. Super simple, sync threads. Then I do the convolution computation. Right, which is also very straightforward. I'm just going from zero to mask width. And then either I'm using the value from shared memory or I'm using the value from global memory, depending on whether it's in the middle section or on the halos. And then I've got this logic to help me decide when is which. Okay, this code is pretty straightforward. It doesn't have all the conditional checking that we have on the strategy one, at least on the version I showed you, right? So th this could be something that could be beneficial for us. But I wanna talk about strategy two. Strategy two is important because I think it will show us a type of mapping that's common uh, with, with CUDA. And in particular, we're gonna see a mismatch between the input tile and the output tile. Okay, so again, in the 2D case, what we're doing is we've got this mask, it's a two-dimensional mask, and we're gonna keep it square in our case, so there's only one effective dimension, the mask width, and we're just gonna calculate the output, uh, which is also gonna be uh, based on um, a square output tile, where each output element is essentially the mask overlaid on top of it. Okay, so two-dimensional, um, and what we're going to do is all the threads, because we're using strategy two, if I have and if I have X threads in my block, all X threads load the shared memory. But a smaller set of those threads will actually do the computation. So let me show you what that means. Okay, actually before I show you what that means, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that, okay, every thread uh, will calculate its corresponding output. So uh, uh, using block index and thread index. Uh, so we've got the output row and the output column. We're going to call it row underscore zero, uh, underscore O and column underscore O to correspond to the XY coordinate that this particular thread will be outputting to. Okay, just something to keep track of. So for example, thread zero, zero here will calculate, uh, will generate whatever the corresponding column and row number is for that particular output element, right? And that's what row O and column O will correspond to. But the complication here is the following. Okay, so 
If I take a look at the yellow tile compared to the white tile, in order for me to calculate all this output, I need the entire yellow tile of input. Right? So for example, calculating this corner element of the output, I need all these elements of the input. Um, right, so if I take a look at the sum of all the input that this particular output needs, I've got that yellow region. Okay. And by definition, what I'm going to say is, for strategy two, the number of threads that I have correspond to the, out, the, the input, so the yellow region. So what does, what does that mean? Every thread loads a yellow element, but only some threads calculate an output element. So I've got this kind of imbalance here that I need to deal with. Let me try to say this one way, all right? So if I talk about the grid dimension, like how, how many blocks do I need? Well, how many blocks do I need depends on the height and the width of P. So I need to take height and width of P, divide them by tile width, in order to figure out how many blocks I need. Okay. That's pretty straightforward, because that's just telling me how many output elements I'm going to end up needing to generate. But how big is each block? Well, in this case, because each block needs to grab the halo, I actually need more threads than output elements. And the number of threads I need in each block corresponds to the tile width in the x dimension plus the halo in the x dimension, which is mask width minus 1. And likewise in the y dimension. Right? So now I've got a certain number of blocks, but each block has a certain number of threads that's based on being able to load all the input elements. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Hopefully I haven't lost you. Because, hey, you're going to need to do some three dimensions for the lab. Um, questions? We, got, we have time. Okay, good. So now, here's the next thing. We need to shift thread coordinates. Okay, so what we have is, remember, we have thread 0, 0. And we need to figure out where thread 0, 0 maps to. Okay, so for example, let's say thread 0, 0 Thread zero zero is calculating, you know, the the upper core, the upper output element here. So if that's what thread zero zero maps to, which is by the way the way we're going to do it here in the code that I'm about to write, we will also say that thread zero zero will load this element of the input. Okay, we need to shift by that, by those coordinates, because we want to make sure that we have the right accounting for which thread is doing what. Right, so I made it simple for myself and said, well, I've got a bunch of threads. Some of them are generating the white region, and the cornermost thread, the first thread, thread 0, 0, will generate the first element of the output, right? Which means I'm going to have a bunch of threads that have higher x coordinates and y coordinates that are not going to generate any output. Like if I took a look at my entire thread block and I linearized it, right, all the row, th 
Row zero threads here. Row one threads, row two threads. What I will have is threads at the latter end of that linearization not participating in generating output elements. Okay. So how do I accomplish this? Well, pretty easy, it turns out. So what we're gonna say is row zero, row, uh, row underscore out, column underscore out are exactly as I said, right? This is what we would do if the input and the output were the same, right? That's the way we have done it traditionally in terms of calculating the, the output indices based on thread and block index. But I'm gonna also calculate row in row i, the input row, and the input column by essentially taking row o and subtracting off the halo size in both dimensions, right? And that's that shift that I was talking about. Essentially taking this thread and remapping it to that part of the input. Super easy. Okay. And that's what that looks like. So as long as I calculate row underscore i correctly, which I did in the previous slide, and I check the boundary conditions, meaning is row underscore i greater than zero, or you greater than or equal to zero, and less than width, and dot, 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 if so, load that piece into shared memory. Uh, I don't know why we do this. Sorry about that. There's, I, we, we, this is, I guess we're gonna use tile as the, the, the shared memory variable. We were using n underscore ds before. Let me just make a note here. This is the shared memory variable for storing uh, n. So now it's super simple, right? We have a bunch of threads, those threads uh, load the halo right here, and then we do the sync threads. But in this case, what we need to do is we have each thread participate in the calculation but only those threads that should be storing something end up storing something, right? We have to check to see that row underscore O is less than width and column underscore is less than width, and then we store it. Okay, and that's it. If I put it all together, actually I don't have a slide for that, but I can take all that code and put it all together and that is my strategy too. Okay. I know there's a lot of details here, right? And it's hard for any human at 9.30 in the morning or no, 10.30 in the morning to look through code and really understand it. And that's okay if you don't get it, right? I, what I wanna make sure is that conceptually you're understanding the difference between these three strategies. But that's what matters. You can always go and look at the code on your own afterwards. Questions? Yes? So one thing I'm having trouble doing is, uh, I guess, translate. Thread index doesn't have a reaction, does it? It does. We have thread index X, thread index Y, and thread index Z. Okay, so extending it into three dimensions actually is not going to be hard in terms of the number of lines of code you need to write. It is conceptually hard, right? You have to sit down and give yourself time to concentrate and map everything out. But number of lines of code is not many, not much more complicated than the 2D version. Yes? So 
let's say for this version, instead of just disabling the output, we disable the entire calculation for that thread. Would the scheduler then be able to reassign the threads that finished early? As long as they're all within their own warp, right? But if they're within a warp with other threads that are working, then no. Those are unused hardware resources. Make sense? It's a very good question. Right, so let's talk about that, right? This warp, warps of size 32, which means that, okay, if any thread within that warp of 32 gets caught up in one of these conditionals and doesn't do anything as a result of that, it's essentially dead time, right? I'm not using the corresponding hardware. That thread's not doing anything. Why not make everything of size, why not make warps of size one? Why wouldn't, I mean, it seems great, right? If I had warps of size one, I'd never have to worry about this. Make sense? But why not? What's the downside of having warps of size one? Yeah. Then you're essentially a CPU. <laughs> right. Then you're essentially a CPU. These are threads that are effectively CPU threads. Um, well, there may be a little, little lighter weight. There's no virtual memory and blah, 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 blah. But there's a substantial cost. Right? I've got to fetch now an instruction for each thread. In the case of a warp, I fetch one instruction for 32 threads. That's a significant energy savings, by the way that I'm not having to go and look in a cache to do that. So, yeah, in fact, we want warps to be larger. If we could, the hardware designers would prefer larger warps. The software people will say, well, the bigger you make a warp, it's harder for me to optimize around it. This is kind of an age-old question in computer architecture right here. It comes up in so many different ways. Um, you know, when I was, again, in your shoes, in fact, I was a student, not at this university, um, but I always admired this university because they used to have a supercomputer here, uh, which was, you know, one of the world's fastest. It was a Cray supercomputer. And it was a very cool-looking system. The supercomputers today don't look very cool. They're just... They look like a data center. But when I was a student, they actually had their own cabinets, and they were big. I mean, you know, maybe the size of this entire front of the room, which by today's standards is quite small. But they looked menacing. They had their own physical design. And these crays were kind of designed as a... Uh, what would I call it? Like an arc... Right, so that the wiring could be minimized, the, the length of the wiring could be minimized. Now, the reason I mentioned Cray is because the Cray supercomputer was faster than anything out there because it relied effectively on this warp idea. One instruction operating on lots and lots of data. The warp size, the effective idea, actually we didn't call it warp, we called it vector length. It's the same idea. One instruction operating on 1,024 data elements. Right? These are incredibly long vectors. So by that standard, well, 32 is much, much better. Um, and it turns out that, you know, kind of the universal thing that I didn't really fully appreciate when I was in your shoes is, boy, the world really maps nicely to this idea. You might think, well, this is awkward, right? You know, the, the 32 warps, they all have to, 32 threads in a warp, they all have to do the same thing, and that's super restrictive. The world has data that actually maps that way. Real world data tends to prefer long vectors. And one of the reasons is, well, you know, linear algebra. We tend to have... Um, things like matrices, and these matrices are not tiny. 
they're humongous. Um, so of course, the vector links are gonna be humongous. There's another wrinkle we're gonna throw in there. We'll throw it in there in a few weeks. And that's the idea that, well, yeah, it's a, it's a matrix and it's huge. Maybe it's a million by a million elements, but it's sparse. Meaning there's some real data in there, there's some real information in there, but mostly zeros. So why are we spending all of our time multiplying by zero? Why are we even storing the zeros? Million by million elements, that's, that's a lot of elements. But if they're mostly zero, let's not waste the storage on that. Makes sense. We're getting way ahead of ourselves, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. Do you see warp size changing in the near future? Uh, you know, if anything, it probably will go up. I don't think it'll come down. And in part because um, it's such an energy advantage to have a large warp size. So... And the fact, like I said, real world natural data tends to favor long warps. Okay, good. Well, that's it for today then. Um, next time when we meet, we'll do a little more convolution. And the next big chapter for this course is around machine learning.
testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing.
about back to this question about the cards. Mm -hmm. So I understand the way that we did it, but I was trying to also understand like the combination method. Mm -hmm. And I kind of came down to this was how you would get the answer. But why do you have to multiply by four? Uh, what do you mean by four? Part A, so like the probability that all four are the same suit. Why do you have to do like the times four? Same suit. Yes, it could be any one of the suit, right? Mm -hmm. It could be the diamond, the spade, you know, whatever. So oh, that would be four. And that's of why. Them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.